The Cambridge Dictionary defines a spoiler as a device on a car or aircraft that's positioned so that it stops the air from flowing around the vehicle in a smooth way and so helps to control it. Well, yes, it is that, but more relevant to this video is the more modern definition of when someone tells you something that you don't already know which can impact your enjoyment of a game, show, or any piece of media. So in short, this video will contain spoilers for Final Fantasy XIV. It also does for World of Warcraft, but as we'll soon find out, that kinda doesn't matter as much. I've been keeping tabs on the World of Warcraft lore as it's continued and just finished the main story quest line currently available in Final Fantasy in preparation for Endwalker. In both of these endeavours, I realised that both Final Fantasy's Shadowbringers and World of Warcraft's Shadowlands are dealing with very big cosmic themes in their own worlds, but have approached things very differently. So today we'll be going through how each game approaches their lore in game, how the player experiences, and make some comparisons between the two, and maybe just do a little bit of speculation on where each of the stories may take us next. But as always, if you enjoy this kind of content, I'll be posting videos at least every fortnight, so please like and subscribe below to see more. Now we can start with what's always the most fun part of any discussion, which is to define a couple of things, and today we need to look at two concepts. The first is the difference between story and world lore, then second, what are we actually talking about when we say something is cosmic? Well, the difference between story and world lore can simply be described as the difference between what the creator and the consumer of a world know. When you create a world for a game, book, or even D&D campaign in your head, you have either consciously or unconsciously a list of rules by which that world abides. Your very own laws of physics. The story lore, conversely, is what the players know. This is far more controlled as the creator of this world is also spinning a tale with only the components of his world that are relevant to that story being part of it. A player doesn't need to know all the intricacies of how magic works to know that it exists in the world and that fireball is the best spell. We can further break down the idea of story lore in a gaming sense into two components, mandatory and optional. The mandatory lore is all the stuff that you must play through in order to complete the game, which in Final Fantasy's case would be the main scenario quest or MSQ, and the optional lore is all the side quests, special collectibles, and anything you need to go out of your way to find. In games, these three types of lore flow into each other. If the mandatory lore that you must engage with is interesting, then you move on to putting in extra time to engage with the optional story. If that expanded story continues to be interesting, then you move on to trying to figure out the world lore, either through hints left by the creator or by sources of information outside of the game, for instance blog posts by the creator or even additional books like the World of Warcraft Chronicles. This is why lore is very important to the longevity of a game, because if someone has hit the stage of searching up more and more about the game world, they're invested, which is both good for the community at large and for the business. Lastly, we need to talk about cosmic lore. The first note to make is that not all stories need a cosmic element to it. Look at Stardew Valley, for instance. It's a lovely story about building up your own farm without having to mess with the fundamental laws of reality. But when someone does want to go cosmic in their story, in my mind, it is mandatory story lore that directly relates to the fundamental laws of the universe. For a non-gaming example, in Legend of Korra Season 2, The Book of Spirits, the story revolves around the spirit world, the big meta-universe that has always existed in parallel with the normal world and only hinted at previously through the Avatar state, and occasional flashbacks in both Korra's story, and earlier with Aang in Avatar The Last Airbender. Using one of these stories can be a dangerous proposition, as they almost inevitably become the culmination of what your stories have been doing in the past. It's all led up to this moment you get to look behind the curtain and see what's truly been going on behind the scenes. Has your battle against darkness just been a cruel chess game by uncaring gods? Were you not as righteous as you once thought you were? Or do you realise that you don't have free will and are being puppeteered by a min-maxing psychopath? No matter what your conclusion is, once the cosmic story is out of the box, it must be addressed in all seriousness, as the mechanics of the universe should never be taken lightly. These cosmic stories are the ones which really start to close the gap between what players know and what the creator does. They serve as high points to a story which helps contextualise a lot of what we've done or already know. With that said, Let's start by looking at how World of Warcraft Shadowlands has approached this type of story. For this very video, I finally decided to actually get Shadowlands so I wasn't relying purely on gameplay footage or other people's opinions, so I can confidently say that WoW's story is done poorly, even to someone like me who's actually kept tabs on the lore. If you were a new player starting in the Shadowlands, you'd be completely lost to what's going on. The sad truth is that the lore of World of Warcraft has been out of the cultural zeitgeist for some time. 
Even back in the day, most people who played games, but not WoW, knew the story of Arthas at a minimum, which likely played a big part in making Wrath of the Lich King one of, if not the most popular expansion in World of Warcraft's history, with a record peak of WoW subscribers being at the end of Wrath. For a new player who just boosted to level 50 to jump straight into the Shadowlands, which is the 8th expansion in World of Warcraft's game and story, you'd be met with a variety of cutscenes. First is the expansion trailer of Sylvanas vs the Lich King, who you'd know nothing about, so what's going on doesn't make much sense aside from the ladies doing bad stuff. Then you see a ton of major lore characters like Anduin and Jaina getting kidnapped by flying dudes with chains, again without any clue who those characters are and their importance. Then you finally go to the top of Icecrown Citadel where you perform a ritual surrounded by tons of non-kidnapped major lore characters, and when you finally open the portal to the Shadowlands, some crazy elf looking lady jumps in screaming about vengeance. If you've been keeping up with the story, this all makes some sense, except maybe why every major leader got kidnapped so easily, but I digress. All the characters are known quantities to you. To a new player, nothing means anything, as there's no introduction to characters, so you already have a lot of people on the back foot in terms of what's actually going on. Well, what's actually going on for the people who have been keeping up to date is barely any better for those going in blind. The primary reason behind this is that there is simply not enough build-up to the events of Shadowlands. There is no doubt that this storyline is cosmic as it deals with the very nature of death and the souls of your very character. However, these storylines are normally teased and hinted to over a very long period of time and serve as the culmination of that long process. Shadowlands isn't that. I will give the writing team some credit that they didn't really retcon anything in the lore to force Shadowlands to work. That must have taken quite a lot of restraint. Instead, they recontextualized previous events to fit in the Jailer, who's the main villain of the Shadowlands, as the mastermind behind everything. When I say everything, by the way, I do mean everything, from corrupting an almost godlike titan known as Sargeras, to the creation of the Lich King, corrupting Arthas in the first place, and really just every major lore event in World of Warcraft's history that players would care about. This would actually make for a phenomenal story if it was from the very early days of Classic, there was actual hints to this being the case. Some unknown ethereal whisper guiding events. At first we think it's just the old gods screwing with us, but slowly we realise it's something else. More powerful and ancient behind the scenes pulling the strings of so many throughout the world. By the time we actually reached the Shadowlands, then we'd have had such a long period of time to get invested in the Jailer, it'd be fantastic. Instead, it feels more like he's been shoehorned into events we already really love to give his character some gravitas, which at this point in the story makes him just feel surprisingly shallow. A feeling you don't want to have towards what's meant to be your major villain. The importance of setting up a good villain can be seen in Marvel's Thanos. All of that build up to him being the big bad evil guy made him a true threat that really engaged audiences even though all of his previous appearances in other heroes individual movies were brief snippets that more or less connected him to the events of the film and gave all of the Marvel movies an interesting meta narrative that people were looking out for. Beyond the villain, all the other characters, including your own, also fall drastically short on a narrative level. Since World of Warcraft's release in 2004, the player characters have been alongside some of the biggest names in Warcraft through thick and thin. Absolutely huge, impactful stories that would mean a lot to those characters. For Anduin, we rescued his father in Classic. For Jaina and Sylvanas, we were there when the Lich King fell, and if you completed the Shadowmourne legendary quest line, you got even more special dialogue for those characters. Everyone both alive and dead in Shadowlands we've had a major history with, so naturally you'd expect them to treat you something like a friend or maybe a nemesis. More Walker, champion, hero. Every expansion they have another hollow title to call you and in the walls of text for every quest there is no sense of warmness or hate, no impactful emotions, all just generic sounding dialogue that seems to exist more to serve the purpose of telling you information about what's going on than to bring you into the story. Despite being instrumental in events and characters lives, you play more like an observer than the champion they claim you to be. Compounding the issue with unimpactful characters in the Shadowlands there is also a serious problem with the narrative structure. We can really see this in the cinematic After the Last Raid Sanctum of Domination. In the small one minute scene of Anduin and Sylvanas having a chat, they discuss what's about to happen, what the plan is, what role each of them will, and a little bit about the feeling of what it is to be mind controlled, to be compelled to do something that someone else wants you to forcefully by magical means. 
what it is to serve. The issue is not with the content of the dialogue, but with where it's placed in the timeline. If the cutscene was set before the raid, it would have served to contextualize what's about to happen and even go a little way to justify one of the most despised lore moments at the end of the raid. However, since the cutscene was set after the raid, the audience has already been boiled to the ending and the conversation is no longer viewed with empathy for the characters, but apathy for the fate that was dealt to them. But that's what I've felt and found with Shadowlands. And please let me know what your experience has been in the comment section below. But before I begin Shadowbringers, I'm going to give you one last spoiler warning. If you haven't finished all the MSQ, then come back later. If you love narrative games and haven't picked up Final Fantasy XIV yet, then come back later. You have in the strongest terms been warned. Now before we jump into a full analysis after finishing the MSQ, I do want to say for the record that Alpha No and Alize's dad is an absolute bastard and it's him who doesn't deserve the Levier name. Although, what is that MSQ I just mentioned? Well, it's the main scenario quest or the main storyline of Final Fantasy XIV. This is a compulsory set of quests whereby everything else that isn't the story can only be unlocked as you hit certain milestones in the MSQ itself. So in terms of pacing for the game, it's all about the story. What makes the compulsory nature of this story so important on a narrative level is that it forces each and every player to go through the story no matter when they come into the game. For myself and all the others who came during the WoW Exodus, we all had to start from the very beginning of A Realm Reborn and play until patch 5.5 of Shadowbringers. This means we had to go through all the introduction to characters, places, and the story at large. This strict structure ironically gives the Final Fantasy XIV writing team a lot more flexibility in how they plan out their story in the long term. If you weren't aware, Endwalker is being planned to be the end of the story arc which is started all the way back in A Realm Reborn, which will be a little more than 8 years of story build up to what will truly be a climactic finish. During this entire time, the writers have been able to give us all of the threads of information to keep pushing the story towards that climax in a satisfying way. Although to bring us back to the original scope of this video, the discussion on how Final Fantasy approaches cosmic lore, we need to return to the very starting cinematic when you press login into a new character. Suspended in a beautiful night sky, you hear the pleasant whispers of an unknown woman. Hear, feel, think, she says, as you look around for anything in the unknown space before you finally spot the sun. Zooming in on its radiance, it soon becomes eclipsed in darkness, and from the void an unknown black-robed figure with a red mask emerges. Once more, the mysterious woman tells us to hear, feel, and think, as we are transformed from our regularly clothed character to one with resplendent arms and armor. After a short battle with the masked man where you wield a weapon of pure light, you finally wake up in your starting city. While it seems strange that you're basically thrown right into the cosmic side of things straight away and then just as quickly dragged back into reality, what it does is frame the idea very quickly that we're the chosen one and there's some big bad threat out there that we're going to have to go out and fight. Everything that comes after is based around this idea until we know exactly what kind of chosen one we are as the Warriors of Light and just who that robed figure was, the Asian. These Asians are key to understanding why Final Fantasy XIV's story does cosmic as well as it does. They are a consistent story thread throughout all of the story. In A Realm Reborn, they're the ones orchestrating the summoning of the primals you've been fighting. During Heavensward, they're mustering up your counterparts as the Warriors of Darkness to combat you. In Stormblood, they're pulling the strings of the Empire of Gala Mold, that which you've been fighting for ages at this stage. And then finally in Shadowbringers, Emmett Selch, a member of the Convocation of Fourteen, the ruling circle of this ancient race, even accompanies you and provides his side of the story on the grand history of the universe. While I'll leave the full history for a dedicated lore video, it suffice to say that the Asians play this role as the common cosmic thread is so well is that they're the ones who started the cosmic story to begin with. They are the creators of the Dark God Zodiac and the Goddess of Light Hydaelyn, who was the feminine voice you heard at the very start of the game. This all really shows that the difference between the narratives in Shadowlands and Shadowbringers comes down to two things, investment and planning. Getting invested into World of Warcraft has really changed over the years. At the beginning of the game, in what I'll define as everything before the Cataclysm expansion, you felt more like an adventurer, mercenary, or an actual champion of a very specific faction. You're at major lore events because that's your job. You're not there because the event is meant to revolve around you. The premier example of this adventurer treatment of your character comes from the fall of the Lich King, where you're the chosen champion of the Argent Crusade, but Tyrion Fordragon is the master of that crusade. So of course all the big narrative notes revolve around him and the Lich King, whereas in Battle of Azeroth, 
Lost, the story is revolving around all the major lore characters as it was before, but instead of being a glorified hireling this time, you're meant to be the champion of Azeroth. You're gifted an amulet of immense power, the heart of your planet and of a titan god you've been inadvertently protecting for years and years. But there's a non-factor to the story. Although we keep getting loftier titles that are meant to be significant in the story, they're not reflected in the story whatsoever. This disconnects players from their characters, and as characters are the medium by which you experience a world, it has the flow-on effect that you drift away from the world at large as well. Final Fantasy, by comparison, puts you in the position as the Chosen One, the Warrior of Light, and then really respects what that title would entail. You're invited to major political summits, your input is requested, and when they're planning for big battles like the one at the very end of the Shadowbringers patches when they're summoning Lunar Primals, they make a point of saying that they can fight the Imperials, but they're asking you to take out those primals as you're the special hero who's immune to their soul control shenanigans. Then on a more general level, the game actively calls back to things you've done in the past. For instance, in Shadowbringers, when you're helping a bunch of new people wanting to go out and be their own warriors of light, Alphano says something along the lines of, just as the Admiral helped you into the world of adventure, now you're helping fresh faces do the same. What's important about this is I started in Limsa Lominsa. My first 15 levels were in the pirate city-state and helping with the Admiral. The in fact, it calls back all the way to the very start of your game, despite it being real life years, if you'd have been playing from the very start of A Realm Reborn, is mind boggling. Moving on to planning, the biggest difference here, I believe, is the MSQ. In World of Warcraft, each expansion is modular in a way. It's almost episodic, in that the story is more or less self contained, then it gives a thread to whatever's happening next. It has, by design, a very beginning and an end to the overall story arc. Whereas in Final Fantasy, as you need to play through all the story, while they have very specific story arcs for each expansion, they can maintain an overall narrative that is of the Asian Zodiac and Hydaelyn in the backdrop of all of them. The interesting thing is that you can argue that World of Warcraft is actually moving towards the more modern MSQ style of questing, as the new expansion experience is fairly linear and you do go from story beat to story beat. The only issue for them is that for veteran players, the story doesn't feel impactful as there hasn't been enough build up, and for new players, they'd be completely lost because they don't need to go through the story beforehand. I'd really love to see them keep embracing that style of story questing, and maybe even throw in a lore catch up quest or mini scenario with Chrome early on. Imagine spending 20 to 30 minutes just going through all the story to help catch up new people, because at this stage, WoW really needs to do more to help new players get into the game if they ever want to get back from this absolute beating they've taken. Story is important. It helps pull people into your game, helps them get invested in your world, and even helps to get them into your community. A cosmic storyline should serve as the culmination of what your world has to offer, and what you've been leading your players through for some time. Ultimately, the comparison between Shadowbringers and Shadowlands comes down to a case study of why you need that level of build-up as the former is incredible, while the latter has PC Gamer articles saying World of Warcraft's latest cinematic is a narrative disaster, and players hate it. For Final Fantasy XIV, I am incredibly hyped for Endwalker, as it has the build-up all the way from A Realm Reborn with, if the media tour is to be believed, one and a half times more writing than that of Shadowbringers, so it sounds like a truly hefty experience. Really, the one thing I'm very keen to see is how they do the wind-down from what will be an incredibly impactful battle and move on to the next overall story arc. My bet is that a mini-apocalypse will happen on Eorzea specifically, we'll battle Xeno on the moon as the planet burns behind us, and then the wind down is either a rebuilding effort and all the complications that come associated with that, or maybe even a refugee move to another one of the continents on the planet we haven't explored before, as a more unified political entity and not just the city-states we've grown to love. Thank you all for watching. Like, subscribe, and comment below, as I'm going to keep up my habit of replying to everything, and as always, have an excellent day.